we have sponsors. I said your name. Oh, yeah, he is. Say it and he appears. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Go. Hey. hey, everybody. Welcome to Murder Hobo Inc. Between the Rolls, our Tuesday show uh, where we are not wearing pants today because this is just after Thanksgiving and we've had all the stuffing on us. I'm surprised the shirts even fit right now. Oh, that's pretty cool. Go show it to mom, you troublemaker. <laughs> uh, before uh well before we begin tonight let's go ahead and do this spiel before i introduce everybody follow us on twitch follow us on twitter take a look at our youtube archive if you want to talk about DD, you can hit us up on our discord if you want to join in on some of the one shots we have going on i do believe we have another one shot this saturday planned as we did last saturday uh, all you have to do is hit us up at mhoboinc at gmail.com or at the Twitter, either one of those, and we'll see about saving you a seat. We do like to have the new people coming in. Uh, if you want to listen to some of our past shows, vet us out before we even uh, have you on the show. Uh, you can listen to us if you don't have time to watch, you know, two hour shows. You know, it's not the four hour shows that some people do, but. Uh, if you don't have time to watch those shows, you can listen to us on Podbean. Uh, again, the link is somewhere in the description here on the Twitch channel, as well as our awesome link to some amazing, amazing merch. I'm not a sellout or anything. I just like the fact that these are soft, comfortable, and the tentacles uh, feel really good on my chin. I know how that is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. All right. Uh, and then finally, we have to thank our sponsors for tonight. Pirate Dog Dice, or Dirty Dog Dice, as I like to call them. Uh, proof that you can, in fact, polish a dog turd into a D20, which will then only roll once, as is evident by anyone who's ever rolled a Pirate Dog Dice, um, unless it's one of the good ones. But you have to pay like a whole 50 cents extra for that. I wouldn't go that way unless you're a DM. And finally, right. if your game smells like dog poop, mass just adventure sense. Oh my goodness, this is a long spiel. I, I ooh. yeah, not you, future you got longer. <laughs> oh, nice. If you have brain farts like I do and you need to clear out the room, pick up putrid sewers or ancient library. Ooh, it's not open because otherwise I would probably inhale one up my nose and spend the next hour coughing. Boy, Bloomin' Prairie is very nice. Ooh. And uh, as always, make special requests. Get Carol's uh, chlamydia fence pole up there. Hello again, Arlo. Hi, Arlo. <laughs> as well as With Dirty special Diaper. Special guest Arlo. Oh, hey, how are you doing? I'm talking to people who aren't actually here. Like a crazy person. Yes, that's right. We only live in the TV. Imagination. I... Oh my goodness. Go hide, you weirdo. <laughs> I'm going to poke your eye out accidentally. Uh, they also have other products over there at Odd Fish Games, like their Shine Project. If you're looking to write a story, but you don't know what questions to ask yourself, uh, check out the Shine Projects. It's going to uh, send you in all directions that you never thought of sending yourself. They also have How to RPG with Your Cat because uh, children, like cats, uh, uh, will roll things and make funny tickle, tickle, tickle. I like a crocodile. You could probably RPG with a crocodile, too, although I can't promise you'll have all your fingers at the end of it. Uh, and finally... We have to tell you about a very, very important event happening this February 14th, this February being the one that's coming up, not this year, because that's already passed, and that doesn't make a lot of sense at all, uh, is going to be Murder Hobo Con 2. Uh, check it out. We'll steal your heart, and when you wake up in a nice cold bathtub, uh, uh, you'll know it was for a good cause. Um, yeah, you don't need don't... that kidney. Exactly. What? Uh, but that's pretty much the spiel right then there, guys. We have a uh, interesting topic to talk about tonight. Uh, but before we get to even that, let's go ahead and introduce 
uh, 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 Rob tonight uh, because he's going to tell us a little bit about what happened on our one shot last week, Scavenger Hunt. Rob, introduce yourself and then tell us what you did last Saturday. Well, hey, I'm Rob, and uh, you can find me on the socials at Cthulhu Rob. Last Saturday, we engaged in a little module created by Frank called Scavenger Hunt for first level characters to have a little fun in the glorious city of Cathaway. Um, I played a variant human fighter named Flynn Errolson. Dave played a Loxodon monk named Raj. And Carrie played Chips O'Toole, the um, somewhat infamous gnome bard. <laughs> he will be. <laughs> uh, we were um, students at the Academy Adventure Inc. Academy, and uh, as part of the graduation, they run a scavenger hunt. So we got a list of these things, and each thing was worth a certain amount of points. And then we took off to do it. The list was like there was a handful of barnacles, an autograph from Dwayne the Brick Johnson, uh, a pincher from the underground. Crab Fighting Club's uh, winner, um, some teeth from Salty Tavern, Salty's Tavern, those teeth, um, <clears throat> a souvenir thimble, mm -hmm. and an item with a rooster on it, um, which came in handy for some dick jokes along the way, a uh, gambling token from Archibald Meat Pants, which I think is another dick joke, but I'm not certain, and um, a crystal pendant from Esmeralda who rolls about the city in a cart. We looked for that bitch all over and never saw hide nor error. <clears throat> so um, to set the tone really early in the night, when Frank asked for the first Arcana roll, both David and I rolled a natural one and Carrie rolled a natural 20. So luckily we got lucky. Imagine uh, that the person who makes the dice got the natural 20. Yeah. How yeah, does that work? Imagine that. <laughs> uh, so we went through that list and got the clues about who was who and what was where and yada yada dingy dingy. So we took off and made a decision that because three of the things were kind of close by on the right side of the bridge, we'd go that way. So we split and decided to go to Salty's Tavern first. Now, mind you, we had no money. None. So um, we went to the Salty's Tavern. There were some barbarians throwing axes at a wheel on the wall. And um, in short order, for some reason, the barbarians took a uh, dislike to chips. Um, so chips played a poison cover, um, which went over really well. Uh, right. And, and, and uh, distracted things enough that I was able to pick a couple of pockets and get some gold in my purse. Um, but, um, <laughs> while chips is playing because I pickpocketed some gold, um, and managed to get away with it, uh, a, a fight ensues, which was my plan all along. Cause I thought that was how we were going to get these teeth and I didn't want them to be my teeth. So I thought if we could get other people to fight each other and just dodge in and get the teeth, we'd be groovy. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so um, Chips is killing it. And um, Matthew McConaughey hey, strolls on up to Raj like, all right, all right, all right. How am I going to get your girl to play my place? And uh, Raj basically becomes Chips' manager. And in gathering a deposit for Chips's, per Chips' performance the following night, which she still knows nothing about, uh, he opens his coin purse and finds out that he has, dude has some teeth. Meanwhile, Chips and I get into all kind of shit on the other side of the bar um, and have to make our escape. <clears throat> uh, I get bashed in the back of the head with a mug of ale. Chips makes it out freebie. Uh, Raj then looks around, uh, goes, hey, what the fuck? Where did my people go? And then he gets confused by the wrong door, uh, redirected by the bartender, and also clapped by a mug of ale on the way out the door. Did I say we were first level? Yeah. <laughs> Every single one of us had like 12 hit points. So, um, or I think Chips actually had a little less than that. Mm -hmm. But um, we got out. 
and uh, what was the next little bit here? Um, okay, so we tried. Then we did, we're like near the docks, so we go. Okay, let's go get a handful of barnacles from the docks. Okay, the right side of Cathaway's docks, completely up and down the river, clean. Cathaway's docks clean. This is some bullshit right here. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, Raj found a rusty scimitar in the gutter, which like probably would have come in useful had we gone to the right place, maybe, or it was just oh, a big fucking red herring. It sounds um, like it was a murder weapon disposed of in the garbage. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 we dutifully collected it so that good, we could good, possibly yeah. charge with that crime at a later time. Oh, yeah. um, and then I spotted a press gang. We dove into this butcher shop to avoid them. This burly, probably very hot half orc butcher woman, like, um, was there. And kind of as a dodge, I was like, "Oh, um, um, yeah, we're just looking for some sausages." And I couldn't see them because they were right above my head. And so then I got on about some other meat. Meanwhile, the press gang will not come in her shop. Obviously, they've met her before because she is buff and tough um i end up buying a couple of pounds of meat for two gold it's kind of expensive meat a gold piece per pound but anyway um she gave us directions to the macabre theater although she didn't know anything about where the underground crab fighting ring had been we went to the macabre theater to find it closed uh so like i suggest we roll around back and check to see if maybe the back door had been left open by any chance um <clears throat> or there was anybody back there maybe. So I um, find the door open with a crowbar and um, then go inside. Well, actually, I think I handed the crowbar off to Chips who pried the door open. Um, that low center of gravity gave her really good leverage. Um, <clears throat> we step inside and are confronted by a bugbear and Frank says, roll initiative. So I get all brave and fill my hands with swords and step around chips. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. We just found your door open, like chill. And the bugbear growls and some weird shit goes down where we're not sure what the fuck's going on. I hit the damn bugbear and it falls over because it wasn't moving. It was just standing there growling at us. Um, turns out it was just a really annoying prop. <clears throat> and as we go out into the macabre theater further, um, we go up onto the stage area and there's like these props and a bunch of arrows showing where they move around and which way we're supposed to go. Uh, if there was good lighting and stuff, it had been cool. But as it turned out, it was like um, going to Spirit Halloween's haunted house in the middle of the day uh, kind of thing. <laughs> well, that'll do it. Yeah, the lighting did not work it up. It was pretty low key, except when we were getting close to the lobby and uh, a skeleton lurched out of a coffin and grabbed onto Raj. And I had to cut its arm off, except it was just another freaking prop. <laughs> so, which like now we're jumping at everything. We go into the into the lobby and look for the gift shop, and sure enough, there it is. And uh, pick up a a thimble, which it's it's just beautiful and has you know it's old silver and it's marked MT. Maybe it's from a Cobb Theater, maybe it's not. We're like, yeah, cool. I throw it in the pouch with the teeth. Throw that in my pocket. And I go to go out the door. Uh, like something tries to stop me and then I break through it. So my homies go like, oh, something tried to stop him. Let's go back out the back and meet him around front. <laughs> well, I happen to walk out of the theater and run into the owner <laughs> and have to like bullshit my way. I was like, hey, yo, no. Like I was, I was like, we were cruising with my friends and we noticed that your back door was busted. So we came in to see if anybody was here or anybody was all right. If there was a problem, um, you know, uh, like, sorry, yada, yada, yada. And then I came out the front cause we were trying to clear the whole building and make sure that there wasn't any hankiness going on. I came out the, tried to come out the front and something hit me and then knocked me flat and uh, hit me in the head. And, and like, you know, here I am, uh, and she's kind of going for it. And then Chips and Raj roll up. And um, then her two sons roll up. And they're like, Hoo -hoo. well, their names are Larry and Larry. And between them, they have 18 teeth. 
if that tells you anything. Uh, one of them <clears throat> fortunately develops a fondness for chips. Chips kind of um, pseudo seduces him into distracting his mother and brother while we take off. So he goes, hey, Ma, we better go check and make sure there's nothing. And I'm like, yeah, man, somebody hit me in the back of the head when I was leaving. So like, there's got to be somebody in there. She tells us we better be there when she gets back. We're like, yeah, fuck that. We're out. Sure. Uh, wow. Well, where the hell am I now? Wow. This was a, <laughs> there, a lot happened. I, uh, you know what? We'll go ahead and cut it short there. Let me let me get to say, let me get oh, to okay. that. that um, anyway, we went through another couple of fights. We couldn't get Dwayne's autograph. Uh, the fucking teeth bit me in my pocket, and the fucking oh. thimble cursed me. And yeah. now I got to figure out what that's about sometime later when I maybe play this character again or not. Um, Jesus, Chips play. We went to another place. Chips end up playing closing time to calm the bar down, and uh, they have to fight a couple of guys. But wraps them. Anyway, all the crap that goes on is absolutely hilarious. But anyway, we won. We got nine points. The teeth yeah. and the thimble were worth nine points, which was more than like most of the other shit combined. Nice. There we go. Sounds like you should have just kept knocking teeth out of people. That's 15 minutes. Get, so yeah. No, it <laughs> took however long at my introduction was, and then that no, that's fine. Uh that was uh last Saturday's uh one shot. Again, we have another one shot coming up this Saturday. Uh, hit us up if you want to join in on it. Uh, there are certainly crazy shenanigans. I kind of feel bad because I would have loved to play in that scavenger hunt. It sounds oh, like. Oh, we would have loved Kyle, to have you. I think you, you have. I think you I have? have. Yeah. I've, I played that, I've played that module before. I was, would play it again next Saturday. I think you have. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I don't think so, but I imagine Jub Jub. And a butcher oh. would be a great combination. That would there. be a great combination. <laughs> My beloved first sight. I mean, I think the balance of that party would be... Or death for property damage. Chaotic, to say the least. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh my goodness, what a segue. Speaking of party composition, uh, the topic, topic of tonight's uh, uh, show tonight is talking about party composition. Uh, all of us here are DMs, all of us here are players, uh, and I'm sure at some point we've looked at the party of four wizards that are about to run through Tomb of Annihilation and thought, yeah, no, this is the end. <laughs> they have a bandolier of unlimited healing spells. Yeah, there you go. That's it. So, uh, each of them. Let's go ahead and have Dave introduce himself uh, uh, and talk a little bit uh, uh, about party balance, what that means. But first, introduce yourself, David. Please allow me to introduce myself. <laughs> Hi, I'm David. Uh, I'm on the show Cacophony. Here Apparently, you're a man of wealth and fame. Uh, I'm also, yeah, I am. <laughs> I'm also uh, on our Calamity uh, campaign, uh, both the A side and B side. I play Ingve on the A side and Crow on the B side. And in Cacophony, I am Zadar, the arcane trickster. Changeling. Changeling, yeah. So who hasn't changed form in quite a while? So. But yeah, party party composition. Oh man, my accent. Hey, wait, can out. I ask you about that real quick? I mean, you know, yeah. those of us that watch the show want to know: is it just because Zadar enjoys playing with their own boobies? Possibly. That's a yes. That's a yes. Possibly. <laughs> that is a yes. <laughs> or Zadar might just <laughs> like the attention. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, Zadar is a complicated character. <laughs> it's very complicated. Indeed. Uh, it makes a good addition to any party, though, especially yep. having a changeling in the party. So, yeah, yeah and a rogue. Yeah, that's a, that's a thief. Uh, that's an arcane trickster. So, magic using there, too. So. I was just thinking to myself, you know, if a changeling doesn't change shape after a while, is that like the first death of a changeling? 
Like, do they stop becoming a changeling? If no. They... <laughs> I mean, yeah, okay, fine. No, because sure, changelings sure. have personas, you know, and that that's that's the main goal is to have a persona, which is a shape that you keep to blend in, uh, you know, and become, you know, so a, a so member hot, of the community. Hot Babe Sadar is your persona. Yeah, uh, it's it turning like. out to be. <laughs> unless you get I, a really good spy mission, you're not going to pop out. <laughs> One shot idea, murder mystery. Uh, uh, it's a changeling who's. It's Sadar done it. It's Sadar. A changeling with uh, with amnesia. There we go. Z- Sadar. They've just been in that single uh, 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 persona for such a long period of time. Yes. That they forgot they were a changeling. And now their other personas are just kind of popping out, doing these chaotic things. Uh, yeah. And occasionally murder. And of course, murder. And Zadar is trying to solve the murders. <laughs> it's solve. been you the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> <Hold up> the <laughs> mirror. <laughs> oh, no, man. Uh, but uh, let's go over what uh, we're talking about. Party composition. Party mm-hmm. balance in composition. So <clears throat> Yes. Let's go ahead and explain that a little bit uh, just to get the folks on the same page uh, 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 before we really dig into the topic here. Okay. What is it? Party composition is the company is, well, it, it depends. I mean, like with the kids, the I just let them play whoever and whatever they want to play. I mean, we're not really thinking about a party composition and, you know, as a DM, you know, you kind of, you kind of got to roll with it. You know, it's just like, you got to know when to pull the punches because they don't have a healer <laughs> you know, or something like that. You know, you always run into that, but uh, essentially your party comp, the ideal party comp is to have at least one healer, a fighter that's tank tankish and probably uh, at least two kind of uh dps i say dps that is wrong term that's a gamer term um glass cannon yeah pretty much so a spellcaster and perhaps a bard or a rogue uh so a rogue uh bard is perfect because they can fit a lot of different niches but um but yeah so basically you want to have one of each particular fighting style of class or you know um you know healer cleric druid something like that so uh that's that's usually your ideal party comp you know uh the the ideal is five uh five individuals but whether or not you can have five people to play that's another story five e they base composition on a four member party but yeah um yeah the four member uh, party is is yeah, it's perfect. I mean, we use it here on Murder Hobo a lot. So. Yeah, four or five is really like kind of my favorite sweet spot to have a party mm-hmm. um, because you do get to cover all the bases that way if you're trying to have a balanced party. I will reiterate, I know I've said it before on BTR, but I think the concept of balance in D&D is like a big mind fuck that people do to themselves. <laughs> Because I can balance out anything as the dungeon master by adjusting it. Yeah, I was about to Your say, numbers and fucking twits don't matter at all. No, um, no, there's no such thing as perfect balance in D&D. <laughs> balance in D&D is something that evidently they want you to use when you formulate like how you write your modules and this and that and the other thing. Um, that's why the rest of us do third party hot shit homebrew and have a lot of fun. Sure. Uh while we're kind of on the topic before we don't even delve into uh, our script here um talking about balancing for a party um obviously uh if we have a party where it's all rogues or they're all glass cannons or something like that how much is it reliant on the dm to um modify to modify and how much is it on the players to uh strategize so if we do have that party of all rogues they're all glass cannons they can't help each other really all too well with sneak attacks maybe one guy can um but no one's really say a tank 
uh, is it up to the DM to modify or is it up to the players to approach situations that give them the best advantage? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I think it's a combination <laughs> of both. I it, mean, it, it has to be a combination of both. And, and that kind of a setup where you have a single composition either has to be a fuck it we're going to be goofy one shot like we do on saturdays sure or it has to be like totally everybody's in on it from the beginning and you flex your subclasses across so that you can cover more bases like like four rogues but one of them's an arcane trickster um or four rogues but one of them's got the i can't even remember what the hell which rogue it is soul knife yeah and they're like the above road. above fifth level. Yeah. So you're you covering a lot. You got the phantom. I mean Soul Knives yeah. can deal a lot of damage. And like there's the Phantom, which can like avoid a lot of damage. So maybe they're your partner to go up there and and make your enemy look at them instead of you, and everybody gets to fucking sneak attack because the Phantom's keeping them busy. Sure. Um we ought to try that on Murder Hobo. I mean, I've I've a run single par- with single, a single party class. Uh, party. We've yeah. already thrown the fucking outline out the window. What are we going to next? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Um, uh, on we the topic here, uh, do you guys uh, prefer as players, let's go as players, we kind of talked as DM, as players, when you hear what the other three people, the other two, seven, eight, 42 people are doing, right? Do you guys try and balance the party or do you just say, don't care, walk in there and do the best you can? I think I know David's answer personally. Uh, uh, So let's start with you, David. Just do you try and find the balance in the party or do you just say, you know what, let's just do something? If I if I get the notice of what everybody's playing, you know, when people turn in their their character name class and all that yeah i'll i'll prep for it and just like okay we're gonna need a cleric (laughs) right or something like that so yeah so i base the character the whole 86 of them that i have Mm -hmm. uh uh i go through the roster and pick one that'll be appropriate uh for for that night so yeah i do plan to try to plan ahead so Mm -hmm. And as a DM, do you prefer to have a party that's balanced or is it just kind of, you know what, the kids are going to pick what they pick and it's fun regardless? Uh, on the campaign that, I, that I'm running for some friends of mine right mm-hmm. now, um, as a DM, it's only two other players, but we mm-hmm. balance it out with NPCs. The, well, actually, they're, they're, play, they're characters. They play two characters mm-hmm. So in the party. So we have like we have an aberrant mind sorcerer, we have uh, a fighter, mm-hmm. and we have a divine soul sorcerer, and uh, also a paladin. So, so they're 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 a pretty good balanced party. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. But but yeah, I, I allowed my players to play too, and that's how we balanced it out. But as a DM, if I found felt that it was lacking somewhere or whatever i throw in pcs in to to balance the party so okay all right and uh uh rob what do you think as a player do you like to try and fit into the mold yeah or do you see the mold and just say screw it i'm gonna overbalance it. <laughs> no no i mean dave and i are, are often i mean every once in a while i'm like right up johnny on the spot this is what i want to bring to the table and i put it out on the reply all so everybody knows and then uh David usually kind of hangs back and waits till everybody's done. So he's like more intentionally doing it. (laughs) But when I get like to where I'm not sure what I want to do, I'll also hang back till almost the end and go, okay, this is who I'm going to play. Um, I I, I wish we always did that for the one shots because then we could do things that like would be great. Like we could decide we need to reply all but remove Frank so we can decide that we want to do an all barbarian party for his one shot. And we've done that a few times. I know. That's what I'm saying. We've done it. We and David and I and and uh, what the heck was it? It was uh, Talon and or no Raven and Riddle. Um, I'm losing her name right now. I can't her remember name. her name. Yet. But uh, at yeah. the moment, I can't either. But yeah, 
two we barbarians. talked about it and we built a, a party that had two barbarians to tank it up because Frank said it was going to be a rough one. Oh yeah. We had a big and little barbarian. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, but yeah, um, I like a party that gets a mixed composition, but as a player or a party of all one composition, but the same caveats that apply as a DM apply as a player with that. Um, I'm really groovy with a let's fuck it all and have a goofy one shot. Mm -hmm. But for a campaign, I want a bit more of a composed party. I can, and if people want to do a single class option for a party, I can write my campaign toward that or modify it or rewrite it toward that. Um, Sure. Because, you know, my, campaigns 15 percent writing and 85 percent improv sure uh so let's go into campaigns a little bit um have you guys ever considered doing a one class campaign maybe not like the full year long two year long uh uh, campaign but maybe like a little miniature 10 sessions 20 sessions something like that uh, uh what kind what what does a campaign like that kind of look like for you guys i'm gonna guess that no one actually has thought about this <laughs> no i have <laughs> i've run oh, it okay all right <laughs> I have. uh yeah i mean i dig it uh you know because there are so many subclasses so if you pick the right core class and all that i mean you can really have a good dynamic party you know, like, uh, for example, I want to say, uh, I mean, paladins. I mean, God, can you imagine party of paladins? You know? I think I would hate that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, uh, or let's see, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Uh, fighters? Yeah. You know? A party of fighters you know different different fighting styles and uh uh subclasses so mm-hmm. i mean fighter is like a s- extremely diverse class now especially yeah, now. now in dungeons and dragons because yep. of all the uh traits you can get from tasha's uh cauldron oh, yes. of everything and stuff like that i mean if if you want to be a lucrador you could be a Lucador, and I totally want to do that. I want to do a whole party of Lucadors. There's going to be a Loxodon Lucador in my uh, upcoming game that I'm starting to discuss. I would love it. Oh my god, that would be awesome. Sure. But, but yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, you could either plan for it, pick the, the, the most optimal class or something like that, or you can just have your DM can say, look, you, you know, this is the class that we're going to use for this campaign. Do with it what you will, you know, and just kind of sure. leave it to the players, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, before we go over to Rob, you do make a good point with, uh, with Tasha's, with, um, and Xanathars. I don't recall, Xanathar's, just the piles upon piles of feats that you can get. Exactly. That, range that can really uh, uh, change how a class works. Um, I know, for example, uh, the um, what is the medicine feat? That might uh, be medicine feat healers. Uh, the yeah. healers kit one. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. You made your surgeon uh, barber or whatever based around that yes yeah Yeah. based on that i can't remember the name of the feat exactly at this moment in time but it allows you to use your medicine kit to actually give someone hit points back rather than just stabilize them Mm -hmm. yeah and so uh uh, we have uh in the cred campaign we have our monk who can do some healing exactly uh but that's supplemented by the healer's feat, feat which i am never going to uh, uh, it is just healer. There you go. Yeah, it's healing. healer fit. Um, but I've put that on uh, a, a thief just because fast hands, you can do extra healing mm-hmm. as a thief that way, or uh, a barbarian uh, I've had with the healer feet just because she's a tank who can also 
kill people a little bit. Why not? Um, yeah, so, oh, my goodness. There was a good question to the feats thing, and I completely and utterly forgot about that. No, no, I mean, it's such a, <laughs> yeah. Well, we were One talking about things... how to develop a one class party into yeah. covering more bases by using multi class, or not multi classes, but, but by using feats and subclasses as the way to compose the party rather yeah. than changing classes to just use feats and subclasses to build an awesome party. I mean, multi-classing is an option too. I mean, you can always do that, but I mean, if you really want to keep it purist and still one class, I mean, <clears throat> you know, and coming out this month, there's going to be another way to maximize oh. which it with Strixhaven because with Strixhaven backgrounds fuel more feats there are feats attached to the backgrounds so it's crazy it is crazy i'm getting to the point where i can't keep up with it anymore yeah i try, to, I try to stay up on it man because <laughs> i'm just like you know one new book coming out gotta have the new shiny and yeah i mean i, I just get into it and uh i start thinking about uh the dynamics for with creating characters for different parties and stuff like that. So I look at things like feats for Tasha's. Uh, I'm definitely going to be looking at backgrounds for Strixhaven. I mean, because I look at backgrounds now and you do get some benefits to a particular background, uh, proficiencies and things like that. So, so. Yep, Outlanders ranks the best mm -hmm. as far as backgrounds still for giving you the best range of things of any of the feats, but mm -hmm. Certainly has the more most text to it. Uh, Gladiator is a good one. Oh, and yeah, yeah. It's a great fleet. Uh, fleet. Um, fleet. <laughs> dual wielding is is really great if you're doing a fighter. Mm -hmm. uh, take the two weapon fighting style and dual wielding. Wow, all of a sudden you can attack twice every time you attack. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, on to you, Rob. Uh, before we got distracted with. Yeah. Uh, with topics of feet, um, you were talking about you wanted a campaign where it's more well balanced. Um, but does that exclude uh, doing a one party one? No, uh, um, class? not at all. And that's that I've actually run a one class campaign that was 16 sessions um, and at about three to five hours a session. Mm hmm. Um, it was in my previous D and D mode, which was a kind of homebrewed mash between um, rules, rules, cyclopedia, and the uh, first edition Dungeon Master's Guide, and I kind of balanced a system out of that with it, which leaned heavily on the old basic idea of uh, keep it simple, stupid, but allowed for a lot of flexibility and other things. But I ran an all cleric um, campaign. They were all um, members of the same order, and uh, they were sent on a mission by their church, and that was the basis of the campaign. So, on a mission uh, from uh, their god. <laughs> I'm on a mission from God. Uh, well, okay. anyway, it turned uh, out the same... abbot was the BBEG, so it's all right. We <laughs> <laughs> um, sent them to get rid of them, and they managed to complete it and come back. With the clerics, were they all uh, being in the same order, same domain, or well, at least very similar domains? We didn't have them. Oh, you didn't? We didn't have domains um, exactly have... back then. Okay. We were just clerics. <laughs> <laughs> and whatever your god was, uh, those gods had traits like and most gods had like three or four things and so we kind of designed them to go on those paths mm -hmm. um so uh and and made some decisions about that and the way that we made it so that we could do it at that point was to kind of make a subclass by multi-classing one level mm -hmm. they could have one level in another class as in first edition you ad and you could okay um, you could have, I mean, you could multi-class in first edition AD&D. &D. In basic, you couldn't multi-class. So, not originally. So you were going crazy with this. Okay. Well, uh, no, I was trying to replace my AD&D &D that I'd lost in a flood. I had all the materials for it there. And mm -hmm. I was trying to replace having that material with what little I had because I was a poor ass at that point in time. 
Um, but yeah, it's, it's possible to do that and still come to a point of balance when you have, you know, I, we had two fighter or, you know, cleric fighters Mm -hmm. and we had, uh, one person who didn't multi-class at all. So he was a second level cleric when it started, Mm -hmm. he was the leader of the party. And then the other character came from a little bit of a like shifty background. So he had a level in thief and a level in cleric, but as they progressed, they could pick up more cleric levels, but not more of that basic level. And that's how we kind of gave some skills across. I would occasionally give them bump ups in their skills based on those things, those classes, but I wouldn't actually let them level up in those classes Okay. for the purpose of that campaign. But we had all talked about it after running, you know, normal crap for a long time. And we were like, we want to do something different. And so they suggested it and I went with it. All right. Um, going back uh, a little bit to the previous question, I was suddenly starting to remember what it is. Uh-huh. When we run one class, one shots or one class campaigns, at that point, how important does balance come into it? Because you kind of have the balance between you want your tank, your healer, your utility, your glass cannon to use the four E terms. Yeah. Uh, um, do you then it's like, OK, can I come on here and just say, yeah, pick a wizard and roll up fourth level. We'll see you on yep. Saturday. Yep. And do you guys communicate or do you feel the need to absolutely have to communicate at that point? It's like, OK. We can't all be avocation wizards. Someone has to be the abjuration wizard who's getting the crap beat out of them. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. you would have to have communication among the other yeah. players for that. You can't just... Yeah, with a single party, single class party, you definitely got to communicate it. Or it's one of those things where nobody communicates and everybody does the same thing and it shows up on Saturday night and it's really goofy and Frank's probably been laughing his ass all week. Yeah, because he, he knows that. he knows everybody is playing the same class, but he ain't saying shit. <laughs> um, Damn. Or Frank. there's three barbarians and a and a divine soul sorcerer. Oh God, uh, you know whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that sounds like fun. Yeah. No. What are we talking about here? Okay. Um, off script again. Um, I'm here. Oh yeah, I know absolutely. Hey. That's what you're here for, Rob. Uh, 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 is because when I ask these off script. Um, We're talking about uh, uh, party balance. Let's skip the class. Let's not talk about that. Let's talk about, uh, as we brought it up here, backgrounds, backstories, how the PC acts. Mm -hmm. You know, do you? It probably is a struggle to have edge lord party, uh, even if one of them is a cleric. uh, 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 so let's talk about background uh, 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 balance. What do you guys think uh, is a good balance uh, f- as far as traits um, uh, and backstories and kind of that? What do you guys look for? Um, for example, uh, in the cred campaign, uh, uh, we uh, uh, lost lost our sorcerer. Uh, but gained uh, uh, Jacob as our our thief, our cartographer. And when talking to him, just being like, yeah, yeah, tell me about the background of your character. And it's like he describes something, and I'm like, okay, this is actually Ernie's background character, and we can make it work, but we have to change it a little bit because I want to see a different dichotomy a different way of how that affects a person as opposed to having two characters with the same thing acting the same way so how do you guys as dms react to those things um probably it's a little less important with the kids david but you tell me if i'm wrong so again simplify the question here what traits do you look for and what backgrounds do you look for uh, uh, in PCs in general to make sure that you have an interesting dichotomy and interesting interaction between players? Uh, again, David, we're going to start with you. 
Uh, well, one of the things that uh, I did, like, for example, I even use, I threw race in there too, in the mix to oh, okay, kind of yeah. help a dichotomy. It was uh, two bards, one T flame, one celestial. Mm -hmm. So yeah, interesting dichotomy of that. Uh, their backgrounds, one noble, the other, you know, an urchin busking on the streets, you know, and stuff like Uptown that. Uptown so, girl. Yep, Upton okay, Ghoul. Yeah. <laughs> so, Soon enough, so, guys. so yeah, uh, noble background, the other was urchin, you know, and uh, that the main for the, the, those were just two members of the party that, that made an interesting dichotomy, you know. So, you know, the same class, but, you know, uh, two different background stories and stuff like that, you know. Sure. And you had the racial abilities thrown in there, too, with the celestial and then also the tiefling and stuff like that. So okay. that was just one example that we used uh, with background and race. So. Sure. Okay. Uh, uh, over to you, Rob. You know, uh, what kind, when you're running a campaign, probably more so than a one shot because a one shot players just going to get thrown in. They're doing it yeah. in one night. It Backgrounds how you build your character. So, yeah. So let's talk about campaign when your players are bringing up their character backstories. Uh, what do you look for um, to make sure it's a well-balanced party more role-playing wise, I guess. Yeah. And while you answer that question, I'm going to excuse myself and see to my camera right real fast. No problem. No problem. <laughs> Uh, I would say that looking at it from the DM perspective for me, if I want to have a balance in the party that encourages role play, which I like, I, we, we can just throw the freaking term balance out of it and say, if I want a party composition that would encourage role play and I'm looking at backgrounds, I either kind of want to bend it to like having most of the party have the same background and one of the party have an outlying background, at least narratively. Now, as far as which background they pick from the game system, we can work with that. You could have like Outlander who has the soldier background or they're not, they're not, an outlander background they're a soldier background but they're from the same area and people as the outlander background and say the hermit background all three of those can come from like a outland setting and incorporate to become a character um, but that uses three different backgrounds but it still gives the party a cohesion of being uh, as in calamity from ba uh, and, and then there's one real outlier. So in the Calamity campaign, um, Ingve and, and Rakir are human. Dave's a half-elf, which is a lot closer to a human than Azari's Leonin. And Azari's kind of our outlier there. And uh, we used, every one of us used a different background. Okay. I don't think, no, everybody didn't use the Outlander background. I think only Dave did. And so, I mean, me. Um, mm -hmm. But, like, that's come to be a fairly good, com well-composed party. And yeah. we actually didn't really discuss a lot what we were doing with our characters beforehand. No, no, so we did not. So <laughs> that worked out really well. And I, I like that kind of a thing. And at the same point in time, it's like, um, you can still do that with the single party composition in a in a in a campaign, uh, mm -hmm. and have that spread and get that balance out there and use that that backgrounds to flavor and color that. So I either want like mostly or all kind of one storyline using backgrounds that are different to flesh them out. As far as like okay, most of the party or all of the party is from the same community and has a similar like backstory life experience or i like to have it all the way mixed up because you're all professional adventurers that have gotten together to form this adventuring group through your friendships which may not just be with like the people that are close enough to be family with you and then when you have all those differences you get to have a more dynamic role play environment but when you also have your party composed of people who have a 
stronger reason for unity than we're an adventuring party. So if they have the same like narrative background, not necessarily the background that gives you feats and traits, but that narrative background, uh, if then they have a reason to have that unity and that can present other role play. And if one member of the party is not from the same group as the other member, then there's that kind of role play friction there. I just think it would like party composition in campaigns um, has a huge influence on narrative as well as on mechanical survival. Yeah, sure. Uh, I am bummed that I missed out on that conversation because the end of it sounds really good. And I'm like, ah, I got to go back and listen to the podcast tomorrow during work. Um, You sure don't want to look at us. (laughs) That that is true. That is true. Uh, Mostly because I will lose a finger if I don't pay attention to my work, uh, at least visually. (laughs) Um, How much, uh, so we're talking about those different backgrounds. Um, are we paying attention to the players too to make sure that they can pull off those backgrounds? So you have, let's go with your tiefling. Let's be stereotypical here. Your tiefling urchin, your Azamar noble, and they're both in a party together. And actually, was how do you make around. sure? <laughs> I figured that would actually be the case, but I was just like, yeah, hey, you know what? We're doing, we're doing stereotypical. We're doing stereotypes here because because we're three white guys on the on the. <laughs> okay, so in that case, the tiefling three, has three, to be gay. Uh, also, God, uh, what is the the term? Uh, I, I prefer white For passing. Old, thanks. old school gamer. God. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> uh, how Grognard concerned are you guys when you're? Grog. Oh, that's that is the term. Grognard. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how concerned are you guys when the players, when you encounter those, um, making sure that the players are capable of having that interaction and not taking it outside of the table? Uh, if you know what I mean, just like, okay, you guys are really getting into it and now we're done with the session no, you can't kill the Azamar character for right. for being too rich and noble. You need to quit being complete pompous ass. But right. can I hate myself for falling in love with them mm-hmm. <laughs> and play out the drama through role play that way? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, there's because that. they're an Azamar noble, so they're absolutely freaking gorgeous. Yeah, absolutely, and and. And if and you're then, tiefling, you've got to be gay. So, I mean, yeah, you have to fall for one of your party members of the same part. gender. There's that awkward moment where, you know, you go, you take a break from the table, you go get chips, and then you go out for a smoke break, and it turns out the players are, are making out with each other uh, because the role play got a little too intense, and now they're no, just me? Okay, never just mind. Hose them. No, 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 no. Kyle, <laughs> Kyle, you just hose them off and get back to the game. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that we did for the campaign that I'm running in uh-huh. all that, uh, the, the player characters, they're all related. They're, they have the same father. So Definitely don't do that part, then. So I mean, no, no, that not that part, but you know what I mean. But it but I mean, it made a very <laughs> interesting dichotomy because they were all uh, some of them were split at birth and you know grew up, you know, in different households. You know, sure. Father got around. <laughs> so. I, uh, back in the days of expert, I ran an all halfling campaign. Dad was they were all from they were all from the Shire and had to go out into the world, so they were all related. <laughs> sure. Uh, do you guys have tricks uh, uh, like that where you can kind of help the players along with making a balanced role-playing party? Uh, we're kind of moving off the topic of the class uh, balance because I think that's a little bit easier to do. Yeah. Uh, uh, so. Um, yeah, I mean, we can all throw tank, you know, glass cannon, healer, and sure. and fucking utility together and make a four per, four character balance party mm-hmm. that's kind of the boring end of party balance or composition 
I'm mad that I didn't think about it earlier because that would have been fun to start off with and just completely throw the <laughs> wrench in the works. Um, yeah, I've been trying to keep it off topic all night. Good for you. Um, so, do you guys as uh, DMs, speaking of, you know, you are all have the same father, and so you have some kind of relation that way. Do you guys have other tricks that you like to do to try and come out with a balanced role-playing party? Uh, yeah. Nothing in particular. I mean, I usually read the party to see how it is before I decide what to throw at them. <laughs> you know, like what I mean for, for better role-play. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh my God. I created a character to help them out one time and yeah, they all decided the character was a hex blood. You know, but it was a gnome hex blood, you know, and they freaking killed the NPC that was supposed to help them, <laughs> you know, because they all they all turned murder hub. <laughs> and so just, make your DM work, baby. You know, yeah. Oh, you know, they made me work, but you know, but it was that party where they were all related, as you know, and stuff like that. So I forgot what it was that I was throwing at them. To kind of bring the party together a little bit, but I was using that character, and yeah, I just totally went to shit. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, so yeah, it, little things like that, like uh, objectives, you know, could be used. You know, sure. like a common objective or something like that. You know, or it could be like, uh, okay, let's just use for example. Okay, they're there's a family heirloom that's missing and only a couple of them know a uh, two out of the party know about it, you know? So, I mean, that could make for like a interesting dichotomy. You well, know? yeah, there's, there's some tension there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I don't know that we're using the word dichotomy correctly in that. In this, I don't know. Gosh. Yeah. Dichotomy know. implies two in balance or opposition right um, right right well those who know and those and, who don't so. right there you have you you create a binary there yeah that way but it's like we, i find that you have a hard time having a dichotomy in a party of more than two because yeah as, it's true as yeah. long as you give them agency unless you're going to railroad the hell out of them if you give them agency to be their own characters and grow and change then you ain't gonna have no dichotomies you're gonna have like like heptotomies with all kind of shit coming into it because you got four people you got 17 different romantic connections or not, uh, relational connections between them mm -hmm. yeah. it's not like there's there's four relational connections between four people yeah. every person has a relational connection with the other three in the party or four or whatever how many number you got six characters you got a hell of a lot of even more combinations um, and that all provides for that shifting dy dynamic and tensions yeah. in role play yeah. Okay. My trick is to um, pre-session go like here's here's how you're going to build your characters and like for what I'm doing now I'm starting at third, so I'm kind of getting involved in their building phase and that allows me to go okay like we're starting at third so I'm going to give you this much money oh and yeah I want you to pick one uncommon magic item or and then as soon as they pick their uncommon magic item I customize it and and use that to put a balancing feature into the composition of this third level professional adventuring party. Okay. Just uh, get involved with your characters, or with your players when they're making their characters. Yeah. Talk uh, back and forth think... with them about that backstory. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, do you guys think uh, having the players actually involved in each other's uh, uh, character creations kind of helps that uh, uh, making that party balance both class uh, 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 and role playing wise yeah uh, um, or are we spoiling surprises or I think it's important to let them decide how much they want to share with each other of their characters yeah subsurface you know like everybody can see that you're a red dragonborn okay like that's cool and all and that you carry that really nifty halberd right 
but what about what's inside and what motivates you? And that, and that it's your decision how much of that you reveal to the rest of your party. Well, the, the little campaign that I'm doing with two players with, that are playing two characters apiece, uh, they're a couple. So they were in on it together you know, with like creating their characters and all that. So they sat down, they figured this out and, you know, so, and they worked out the backgrounds and, you know, how they're all related and stuff like that. So Frank's apparently motivated by toast. Yeah. (laughs) Toast is delicious. How else do you make bread better? I can get behind that. You toast it. Hmm? Yeah, toast. (laughs) All right, guys, uh, I hope you all listen in uh, to our wonderful conversation tonight and learn that balancing a party isn't all about just the classes. It's also about balancing the classes and what the DM wants and what the players want and saying no to your party as much as possible. Uh, (laughs) Any extra final thoughts on top of there? Let's start with Rob, since I've put you at the tail end of just about everything else tonight. That's cool. Um, you should put me at the tail end because I'm going to run on. But uh, yeah, instead of instead of just saying no to my players, I like to say no, but uh, it's kind of the other half of yes and. Um, and like I said, I'm 15 percent writing and 85 percent in inspiration in the moment or improv, as you all call it. All right, there you go. And David, any final thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, let let your players i mean run wild with their backgrounds and all that i mean it's your job as dm to kind of tie that all together <laughs> so sure. you know but uh yeah I make mean, them collab, help you collab yeah don't don't restrict your 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 players to you know i mean let them uh just you know work together on something you know, like common background or something. I don't know. But either way, I mean, balance, like you said, isn't just a party. It's 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 everything about the party. So we it's could like synergy, man. Meta, and we could have talked about like uh, why you can't invite Uncle Rob over when Aunt Dolores is also going to be in the party. Exactly. That, that's, ooh, that's next Tuesday. Meta gaming. <laughs> Meta gaming. That's all next time. Meta gaming. <laughs> actual people balance. Yeah. Uh, guys, uh, this week we have Cacophony on Thursday. Yep. Find out uh, uh, what terrible things David and Carrie are up to. Uh, uh, honestly, let's be fair. Frank has a plan for you. Uh, and then Saturday, a one shot, hop on in. I'm sure there's still spots available. Oh, yeah. Other than that, yeah. wave at the camera, everybody. Bye. Bye. Frank's not ready. Oh, there you go.